everyone. Wow, quite a crowd. I have to wear my glasses so I can see in the back. I know, how nice. Let me tell you, vacation, try it. I'm sure I'll be beaten down in no time, but <laughs> anyway, I don't have anything at the top, so over to you, Brad. Can we start with um, uh, Russia's use of the Iranian air base for Syria missions today? Sure. Um, what, firstly, what, what is your general response to this decision by Russia? Um, do you find this concerning? Uh, are you worried about a deepening Russian-Iranian military alliance? Well, I think we're still trying to um, assess uh, and uh, assess what exactly they're doing uh, to the extent that they're doing it. Um, it appears that they, they, they did use, uh, uh, in some fashion, uh, Iranian air bases, and I believe the uh, uh, Defense Department's already spoken to that to some extent, so I would refer you to them. Um, but look, I mean, it's, I guess I would say it's unfortunate, but not surprising or unexpected. Um, and I think it, it speaks to the, the continuation of a pattern that we've seen uh, of Russia continuing to carry out airstrikes, um, and now it appears with Iran's uh, direct assistance. Uh, that at least purport to target uh, ISIL and Daesh uh, targets, uh, as well as Nusra targets. But in fact, and we've seen this continu continually, uh, predominantly target uh, moderate Syrian opposition forces. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Um, and, and frankly, that only uh, makes more difficult what is already a very contentious and complex and difficult situation, and it only pushes us further away from what we're all, at least, uh, say we're trying to uh, pursue, which is uh, a credible nationwide cessation of hostilities and uh, a political process uh, in Geneva that leads to a, a, a peaceful transition. So uh, what's unclear to us right now is, as I said, I think is the, the extent to which they're using Iran. Um, we've seen varying reports that they maybe it was a one-off thing or whether they're, whether they're going to continue, we just don't know at this point. Um, I can confirm, I'm sure some of you have seen that uh, Secretary Kerry did speak to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Um, I, I think this came up in some fashion, but I don't know much detail beyond that. Did, did you Sorry. get from, from <laughs> Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, any answers to these questions? Did they, in fact, say it was a one-off? Did he explain why they're using, is there a military reason for this? I, I believe it didn't come, it did come up, and I apologize, but the call was just, uh, it just concluded before I came up here. Um, but uh, uh, I, I believe it did come up, I believe it was raised by the Russian side, um, uh, you know, and, and I think uh, Secretary Kerry stated our concerns. Last year, uh, when the Iranian nuclear agreement was enshrined by the UN, I think it was 2231, uh, there was specific language that carried over from previous resolutions about the use of Iranian uh, territory or even its airspace uh, for combat aircraft. Do you view this as a violation of the UN Security Council resolution? I think it said provided that it was permissible if the Security Council gave specific permission on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm guessing that didn't happen in this case. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Um, I, I don't believe it did happen, um, and we're looking into it as the, as the short answer to your question. If these reports are true, uh, it could very well be a violation of UN Security Council Resolution uh, 2231, which, as you noted, prohibits the uh, supply, sale, or transfer of combat aircraft to Iran unless approved in advance by the UN Security Council. I just don't have a definitive answer. I know our lawyers are kind of looking at the, and trying to collect as much, many details as they can at this point. What would be the real-world ramifications of that? Just great, Russia violated something, but it, it doesn't uh, really matter. Fair question, and I don't have uh, a complete answer for you. I know that it would be discussed at, obviously, at the Security Council level um, as to what steps may be taken as a result or as a consequence, if it is even proven that, that this happened. Uh, I, I can't give you much detail right now. I have one more technical sure. question. Uh, is it your understanding, looking at the map, it looks pretty clear that they would have used Iraqi airspace? Is that your understanding? And two, do you know of any Iraqi permission for them to use that airspace? Uh, I'd have to refer you to uh, uh, to the Iraqi uh, government uh, 
to speak to whether they gave permission, but yes, normally it is uh, prudent for any country uh, overflying someone's territory to seek permission. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you said they did use it in some fashion. Does that mean that you still believe they are use, using it as a base? Uh, I, I don't know. I and mean, frankly, we've seen varying reports. I mean, I'd have to, uh, you know, re really refer you to the Russians to speak to uh, what their future intentions are regarding the use of uh, Iranian air bases. Um, it's unclear whether, uh, you know, we've seen, frankly, news reports and other reports that they may have just used it as a stopover. We just don't have any firm details. But, but Mark, I mean, I the U.S. is a vast intelligence base. Um, how, how come the U.S. would know if Russia is using Iran as, as, a, as a base? Well, again, we've... Uh, you know, we, we haven't completed our own, uh, I think, internal assessment of what exactly took place. When did the U.S. become aware that Russia had been, was using? Was sure. Um, I, I think through uh, Department of Defense channels, we were uh, told, again, as part of uh, deconflicting in advance, but I believe it was very short notice. Oh, so they gave you, you notice of, of a through, uh, on, on that coordination? I believe so. I refer to the Department of Defense. I think our uh, new spokesperson uh, so, uh, spoke to this in, uh, in Baghdad. And how do you think that this, does it complicate uh, what the U.S. is trying to do in, in Syria? I mean, again, I, I, you know, I don't want to overhype this uh, in the sense that, look, we've known that Iran has been uh, supportive of and an active uh, combatant in uh, the Syrian civil war uh, in support of the regime. Uh, Russia has been supporting the regime. So the fact that uh, they're working together now to carry out airstrikes uh, collaboratively uh, against what they say are terrorist targets, but what we have seen are still a majority, uh, well, I don't want to say a majority, but are still a mixed bag of targeting, which is some legitimate ISIL Nusra targets, but also a lot of moderate Syrian opposition. So I, again, just to uh, get back to your question, I, I don't want to say it's we're surprised, shocked, but uh, it's not helpful. It's not helpful to the situation that we currently have, where we've got the stalemate around Aleppo, uh, where we have no access to humanitarian assistance or not insufficient access to humanitarian assistance, where we have civilian populations at incredible risk. Uh, and we have, we're no closer to any kind of credible cessation of hostilities like we had a few months ago, uh, certainly not nationwide. And as a result, no uh, real uh, relaunch of negotiations in Geneva. So it just, as I said, it complicates what is already a tense, complicated situation. And I have one follow up. Uh, the one is on, the, on cooperation. Uh, um, Lavrov, the Russians did say that they discussed today the uh, uh, possible cooperation. Uh, given uh, given the fact that uh, Ira this is now um, Iran and, and Russia are cooperating, which um, on on this base, um, is it your understanding that that the cooperation agreement that Kerry is seeking uh, with the Russians can go ahead? Given given this, I mean, we were looking for cessation of hostilities, isn't that that was the main factor here? Sure. And everything seems to be pointing in a, in, an, in an opposite direction. Well. Um Again, I don't want to um, – my, my short answer to you is no, it is not uh, – does not preclude the fact that we will reach some kind of cooperative arrangement with uh, Russia, and we continue to pursue that. Um, you know, we continue to speak with uh, Russia in working groups uh, uh, or via working groups, I guess, uh, about ways that we can put in place a credible nationwide ceasefire. Uh, full access to humanitarian uh, assistance, and then again get uh, negotiations uh, restarted in Geneva, and that continues to be our focus. We're not there yet, though. So but, but, uh, on, 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 it doesn't preclude it. So, Sorry, I thought you said, and I apologize well, sure. if I misunderstood. I thought you said, does this latest development now preclude, the, uh, preclude us yeah. from doing that? I say it doesn't. We're still continuing to pursue that. So I mean, they wouldn't have to end this arrangement with the Iranians to have a similar arrangement? I mean, that would that would suggest that you're open to the possibility of a U.S.-Russia-Iran partnership. I, I didn't say that. But no, I, I, okay. I know you didn't say yeah, that, okay. but that's what it means. If Russia has a partnership with Iran and is flying from those bases, at the same time as a partnership with you, that's Russia, 
Iran U.S. partnership. I meant today's events did not necessarily okay. preclude that we would stop those discussions. Now, I wasn't trying to, and, okay. and thank you for trying to clarify or, 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 would they or, have or to clarifying. Um, I, I don't want to uh, jump ahead uh, uh, too far. I think what I would say is uh, we're continuing to have those conversations. We continue to pursue that goal because we believe it's the best way, the goal of creating a coordination cell with uh, Russia um, that we've talked about before in the past, uh, because we believe that's the best mechanism uh, to get this back on track, this effort back on track in Syria. But we don't know all the details about today's events and whether there is some kind of ongoing uh, partnership or coordination effort with Iran. So I think we're we're still uh, looking for uh, clarification on that. I just want to follow I'll get Saeed and then I'll get to you. Yeah, I promise. Yeah. Is this just a one event? That's kind of what I thing? don't know, Saeed. Yeah, or is it going that. to? Is it? Has it happened in the past? Is it part of a continuous? It doesn't pattern? appear to have happened in the past, and, and the reason why is because a they acknowledged it was happening today, they, the Russian authorities, but also we did, as I acknowledged to uh, Leslie, and as the Department of Defense has already acknowledged, uh, they did give us notification. And you said that you know whatever negotiations or whatever process that may go on is not really contingent on Russia right. seizing this kind of, of operation. First of all, do you have uh, any reason to believe that this is going to be just a one event or part of a future, you know, or a process that may go on and in a way jeopardize whatever process that you are trying to do with the Russians to bring about some sort of a political solution? And second, do you have, with all due respect, I mean, do you have the leverage to tell Russia, no, you cannot cooperate or you cannot use uh, Iranian bases to, to bomb what are our targets that they want to bomb? Well, I mean, of course not. And that's a very frank answer to your question. Um, we can only pursue dialogue and discussion and uh, diplomacy with Russia. That said, and we've talked about this many times in the past, is, you know, no one should be under any illusions that there is some kind of military mm -hmm. solution or ultimate victory to be gained in Syria. And uh, in our continuing conversations and dialogue with Russia, they uh, insist that they are of the same mindset. Mm. Uh, again, we've, we've said we have to test this to its limits, this uh, idea that Russia is on board with pursuing a political solution in Syria. Um, we've talked before about these tension points, uh, which is, you know, where they see terrorists, we see uh, moderate Syrian opposition. We do agree that Daesh and Nusra, or whatever it's rebranded as these days, uh, are uh, terrorist organizations. But beyond that, uh, we have a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. And we believe, as you know, that it's important that th that moderate Syrian opposition that has uh, bought into the process, bought into this cessation of hostility, uh, not be subjected to ongoing airstrikes and attacks by the regime. Mm -hmm. I, I have just a very quick follow-up, you know, uh, on the, the potential for yep. these talks and the potential for working together with the Russians. There was a, 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 an interview in, in Foreign Policy uh, of Mr. Robert Malley, uh, an advisor to the President of the Middle East, and he basically said that we can conceivably uh, support an armed opposition you know, for the foreseeable future, and this war can go on and on. In a way, he was trying to incentivize the Russians to, to, to come along. So is the United States prepared to have this conflict go on endlessly? So I haven't seen the interview. Uh, right. My, and I don't, I'm not trying to parse your words right. or hit your, your uh, interpretation of what the interview said. My sense or guess is that he said something along the lines of, what we, including the Secretary, have said before, which is that there's no military solution, but the alternative to a diplomatic solution, which we believe is the best way forward, or a political solution, could mean full-scale war, uh, and that means all the members of the, or not all the members, but various members of the ISSG supporting uh, different factions in this civil war uh, that they believe is in their interest that could, frankly, exacerbate what is already a very difficult situation. And so we certainly don't want to see the last uh, thing anyone wants to see in Syria is uh, for things to get worse. But we believe that uh, unless there's some kind of credible pro process towards a political resolution to the conflict, 
that could very well happen. Mark? Uh, just, just yeah, you, course, you said you said it was unfortunate that, that Russia flew out of the Iranian air base, and and today on that specific uh, mission, yeah. Russian authorities said that the strikes had eliminated uh, five major terrorist weapons depots and training compounds in the area. Do you have information to refute that? And and if uh, if yes, do you think? Uh, if no, do you think it is unfortunate that they are targeting terrorist depots and weapons repos and uh, so training I, facilities? Sure. Uh, fair question. Uh, I'd refer you to always to the Department of Defense who does this kind of analysis and especially our uh, very good people who are, 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 are stationed in uh, Baghdad, but also uh, the Pentagon regularly assesses uh, where these strikes go, or who they hit, or who they target. Weird, so let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. So. so let me finish. So what we continually find is, indeed, there are among the airstrikes, uh, what we would consider legitimate strikes against Nusra, against Daesh, ISIL. But we also continue to see strikes that target moderate Syrian opposition forces. Now we have seen, and you know this uh, as well as anybody in this room, there are disagreements. And that's what we're trying to work through over uh, how to go about this, whether how to separate these and get a clear understanding of who is in the moderate opposition and then uh, cordon them off, if you will, in a sense so that they're protected under a cessation of hostilities. But to, the, to this point, we've not gotten there. And, and as my, the reason I said it's unfortunate is that uh, today's events, if in fact they did hit moderate Syrian opposition forces are only going to exacerbate what is already a very difficult situation. A senior, I, I want to, yeah, uh, on question. this topic, yeah, uh, a Go senior ahead. Chinese military official, Guan Yufei, went to Damascus, sought closer military ties with Syria, and according to Chinese news agency Xinhua, pledged assistance in training Syrian forces. What are your thoughts about China's support for the Syrian government? Well, first of all, I'd refer you to the Chinese government to talk about their level of support or their intentions. Um, you know, we speak regularly. Uh, with uh, Chinese officials on Syria, including ways to strengthen the cessation of hostilities uh, and a way to get the political track uh, up and running, improve humanitarian access. Um, and we're going to continue to have those uh, conversations with China. Um, you know, but I can't speak to what their intentions may or may not be in terms of uh, working cooperatively with the Syrian. But so not their intentions, but the U.S. Um, uh, position on this or opinion on this? I mean, I guess. I, Look, I mean, the ISSG, the International Syrian Support Group, includes the gamut. Uh, we have uh, governments within that group that have worked with the regime in support of the regime. We all know that. We have governments within that organization or that group that have worked with the moderate Syrian opposition. I think the important thing is, do all the members of this group and do any and does China agree with the sense that or the idea? that we cannot have a military solution in Syria, that we've got to get a cessation of hostilities back on track, and we've got to work collaboratively in order to get there. Specifically follow on the fight against terrorists, is the U.S. just as – okay. Is the U.S. just okay. as uh, – on the fight against terrorists in Syria, is the U.S. just as determined not to help um, the Syrian army in their fight against these terrorist groups? Well, I mean, we're not going to uh, work with the, the, the regime forces, if that's what you mean. Um, you know, what I think we have talked about uh, is a way to, if we believe that, sorry, we believe that there is a way that we could, if we address all the issues and all our areas of concern, uh, work with uh, Russia uh, to target specifically ISIL or Daesh, nice catch, um, uh, effectively and really focus our efforts, uh, but we're not there yet. And we're certainly not going to uh, turn our back on these moderate Syrian opposition forces that, frankly, are, vi are vital to any kind of political uh, transition uh, in Syria. Uh, you, please. Yes. Yeah. When, you, when you said that these uh, Russian planes flying from Iran to Syria yes. flew over the airspace of Iraq, could you explain whether that was the airspace of the Kurdistan region? I can't. I just don't have that level of detail. Or, or Iraq, you don't know? And the other part of the question. I, that would be a great Department of Defense question. Okay, I will, I will okay. see Sorry, that. Sorry, I'm not trying to, I'm just, I just don't have that. Okay, level. I'll, I'll get more okay. specificity on that. Sure. You might know. But whether it was the Kurdistan region or whether it was Iraq, I mean, if, if the United States does not want to see more such strikes in the future, 
How about asking whatever authority is uh, airspace they f these planes flew over to deny the Russians permission to fly over their airspace? Well, fair question. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll uh, continue to talk to Iraqi uh, authorities about that. Uh, but how, how large is it? Of course, as you know. Yeah, <laughs> fair point. Um, and, but you know, and, and that's a fair point as well. But. Look, Iraq is a sovereign country, um, and it's going to make its own decisions. Um, but uh, you know, we're going to raise our concerns. This cigar, uh, Mark. Uh, a Russian news agency has said today that, uh, or has quoted Colonel Christopher uh, Garver, yeah. uh, Operation Inherent Resolve uh, spokesperson, saying, "U.S. forces ensured the safety of Russian bombers en route to Syria from an Iranian airbase as the aircraft traversed areas controlled by the U.S.-led coalition." I think I'd, I, I'm pretty sure that's simply speaking about the fact that uh, we deconflicted. We used it, you know, we were, we were, and my understanding is that it came relatively late, uh, but we did receive word that they were going to request and carry out these operations, and that's part of that mechanism, that deconfliction mechanism that we've laboriously discussed here in the, in the briefing room, but it's to prevent any kind of mishap over the skies of, uh, of Syria. Are you alarmed that this thing may even get worse? In, in essence, you have Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, and potentially Iraq, like a Shia camp, you know, fighting the opposition, which are 100 yeah. percent Sunni, Saudi Arabia, and the other countries. Do you see this really getting out of hand? Are you alarmed yeah, I mean, that I, this I, may I, happen again, if you don't reach an accommodation no, with I, the Russians? Sorry, I mean to cut you off. Um, look, I mean. Secretary and others have spoken about this far more uh, articulately or eloquently than I could, but uh, absolutely, there's uh, there's a chance this could, if there's no process in place or at least hope for a political resolution, that this could descend even further into bloodshed and conflict, and as you noted, uh, spread to uh, become a wider conflict, and that's our concern. And that's why we're trying to pursue, uh, to the extent every. Uh, the extent possible, uh, a, a diplomatic solution. Yeah, TJ. As you, you've been uh, listening, like uh, I had a question about uh, the Indian minister visiting Syria, at, and uh, yeah. the minister is meeting the uh, the the president, and is also supporting, like you know. And now you have the reports of China supporting, now Russia, now Iran. So there is a. A coalition that is supporting the the Syrian regime. Uh, so, do we still stand um, on that point that uh, Assad has to go, or do we find a political solution that includes him? Uh, I'll begin at the end of your question. Um, so, we've long said that the view of the United States is that um, there can be no successful political transition with Assad uh, as the leader of Syria. But how that transition takes place, the pace of that transition, uh, is really something to be negotiated in Geneva between the two sides. Um, you know, it's for them to figure that out. But we believe that Assad cannot be the future leader, we the United States believe, that Assad cannot be the future leader of Syria uh, because of uh, the misery uh, and carnage that he has uh, 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 caused in Syria on his own people. Um, in answer to your question, look, I mean, I don't want to uh, give any kind of credence or to your your question saying that there's some kind of pro-Assad coalition forming. Um, I'll let the Indian government speak to what its intentions are. Um, I think, as I said in a previous question about um, China, as I think what is important here is that whatever your uh, – whatever side you support, if I could put it that way, uh, is that there be a general consensus uh, towards a political or diplomatic solution uh, for Syria. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it's just going to get worse. And let me be clear, I'm talking about just a civil war. What we all need to focus on and what we've talked about before is, you know, we're trying to end the civil war that's taking place in Syria so that we can all focus our efforts to uh, destroying 
uh, and degrading uh, dash. Can the, Please. Just, yeah, just can, I do that. can I just clarify that? The, 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 the question was that and the, the Assad is getting the support from not only India, but China, Russia. Uh, yeah. they, these are not just, you know, small countries or small powers. So what is, uh, how, how can you still stand? Because when you come, to, when it comes to the negotiations table, so you're going with this mindset that Assad has to go. And these people are supporting Assad. So, you know, where do we stand on that? That, that my friend, is the art of diplomacy. And I'm not being facetious or lighthearted about it. I'm just... Uh, you know, that's walking into a room and building a consensus uh, and, and dealing with tough issues and coming at it with different viewpoints. We've done that before. Uh, this Secretary of State has uh, shown that he is capable of building that kind of consensus, whether it's on climate change or an Iran nuclear deal. Uh, but that is, as I said, that's the, you know, cornerstone of any successful diplomatic process. Please, Brad. Can you help me? Uh Help us get through the, the new strands on the Clinton emails. Of course, there's yeah. a couple of different things Hope going so. on. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, firstly, we understand that you'll produce now emails for the Judicial Watch uh, case. These are the new emails the FBI was able to recover from the server. Uh, can you explain what what exactly is going on with that? Right. So you're talking about the commitment to produce the FBI emails or the, the, the new, the new work-related okay. emails that were turned over to you as part of after the FBI investigation. That is what I understand. That. Got it. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, so uh, I, I think I've got this right, but I can confirm that uh, last Friday in a court filing, the State Department uh, voluntarily agreed to uh, produce to Judicial Watch any emails uh, sent or received by Secretary Clinton in her official capacity during her tenure as Secretary of State, which are contained in uh, within the material turned over by the FBI and which were not already processed for FOIA by the State Department. So you understand the distinction. Anything that's not already part of that 55,000 that we already went through, that's anything that's new that was uh, sent or received by Secretary Clinton in her official capacity, we would voluntarily uh, produced a judicial watch, those emails. Um, and we also, in that filing, advise that we are, or we would be prepared to suggest a production schedule to the court uh, on August 22nd. So we're not there yet. We're looking at, frankly, the scope of the work involved and trying to come up with a plan. Okay. And Please. before I ask about the FBI stuff, yeah. um, will those emails also be put on your website uh, for the general public in the way that you did with the uh, 55,000 pages? Yeah, I, I don't have a, um, a definitive answer yet. I think, Brad, we're still assessing how these documents will be produced, uh, and we're also in discussions with the court on this matter. So it's part of what we're looking at, I think, over the next uh, couple of weeks. And then just real quick, on uh, yesterday uh, your colleague mentioned that you wanted to see the notes, the FBI notes that would be passed to the Hill. Have you been able to see them yet? And right. Were, were there any issues? If you have, who have you? Did you yep. notice any so, issues? Uh, so we did, as, as you know, my colleague mentioned yesterday, we did ask the FBI that we'd be kept apprised of any information that they provided to Congress. Uh, and the reason why we did this is because it would relate to State Department equities, and this is, a, frankly, a time-honored traditional uh, interagency practice. So. Um, uh, we were provided, we have been provided, emails with the FBI intends to give to Congress, and we've reviewed them. Uh, State Department obviously respects the FBI's desire to accommodate the request of its committees of oversight in Congress, just as we do with our oversight committees. Um, and we're going to continue to cooperate, just as we have with the FBI uh, in every step of the process. Okay, so you reviewed them, but you didn't have any problems, per se, with those being shared? with members no, I, of I, Congress? I, sure. Uh, I think we're satisfied after having reviewed these emails uh, that the FBI has made arrangements um, to ensure that the documents will be transmitted uh, subject to appropriate handling rules, I'll okay. put it that way, or controls, I guess I'll put it that way. And then there was also the issue of the FBI's notes from its uh, interviews that would be shared. 
Uh, have you have you had the chance yet to review those uh, before they are shared? Uh, so my understanding is that we continue to work with the FBI on that on those interview summaries, the 302s, I guess is what they're known as. Um, uh, um, you know, we obviously respect the uh, FBI's desire to accommodate uh, Congress and its committees of oversight, um, but uh, uh, we haven't quite uh, uh, reached an agreement on those. So you have, they haven't shown them to you yet? My understanding is we've not received those summaries okay. yet. Thank you. Yep. Can I? Of course. Topic? Can uh, I go yep. to the Palestinian Israeli issue? Of course. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> According to Peace Now, which is an Israeli NGO, uh, Israel has, is doing surveys, conducting surveys, and planning to take land in the southern the Bethlehem area, uh, which will basically cut, and, and uh, they are building a road to connect uh, the settlement of Efrat with Gibat, Ethan, uh, which will basically cut the West Bank in half. Do you have any reaction to that? Uh, well, we're concerned. Mm -hmm. um, we're concerned because uh, these plans, if carried out, uh, would have the effect of isolating Bethlehem mm -hmm. uh, from the southern West Bank, uh, and that's fundamentally, in our view, fundamentally incompatible with uh, the pursuit of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, the sure. Palestinians, uh, in, in, in turn, they they put together a file that they want to take to either to the ICC or the Security Council. They put together a, a what? I'm sorry. To the uh, International Criminal Court. No, no, I didn't Court hear the first. They put together a, 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 a file. A, a file. I'm sorry. A just file. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you know, as the, um, according to the Geneva Convention, settlements are war crimes. So they put together this file. They want to take it to the ICC. They want to take it to the, the Security Council. Because Israel has been quite obstinate in terms of, you know, heeding your calls and a new advice and so on, why wouldn't you support the Palestinian effort in either venue? Would you, you know, is it likely that you would support an effort in the Security Council where conceivably or presumably a resolution can be taken say, to say that the settlements are illegal? Well, look, I, I, I think I just spoke very forcefully about our, on our view that these settlements are counterproductive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, Israel is an important partner and ally, and uh, we believe that we can effectively make these points to Israel, to the Israeli government, uh, uh, as part of our bilateral relationship. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to uh, go beyond that. But you've re repeatedly you've called on the Israelis sure. to stop Just demolition. One more question, sir. One more, one more. Yes, sir. And that's okay. it. You've repeatedly called on the Israelis to stop demolition. Yesterday they demolished uh, 50 Palestinian homes. You know, they made like you know, a few dozen or maybe more than 100 people homeless and so on. So it, I mean, it seems that, you know, we have like a broken record. I keep asking that question. You keep telling me exactly the same thing. Will there be ultimately a U.S. position where you can actually take a stand, a real stand, that will stop Israel from these excesses? You know, Said, I, I mean, you know, as a spokesperson, right. I mean, it's my job to get up here and tell you what our position is about these kinds of actions. Uh, we make these equally clear to the Israeli government uh, in our private conversations with them. Uh, beyond that, I'm not going to get into the, any detail or uh, hypotheticals about what additional actions we may or may not take. Azerbaijan. Turkey. Thanks. Turkey. Turkey. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what's your take, Mark, on, on the fact that the Turkish uh, prosecution has demanded this morning uh, life terms against uh, Fethullah, Fethullah Gulen, sorry, given the fact that he's, uh, he's living here? And we talked about it uh, yesterday with Elizabeth. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, Fethullah Gulen's uh, request to set up a, an international investigation about the, the coup in Turkey? So. Um I stand by what Elizabeth said yesterday. <laughs> um, no, of course, uh, you know, in terms of an extradition uh, request for Gulen, um, we've, I think, been abundantly clear that this is a process that is separated uh, and apart from any kind of uh, political process, any kind of 
uh, uh, emotionally driven uh, uh, reaction to the events that happened in Turkey. It is part of our uh, legal requirements under the extradition treaty that we have with Turkey. Uh, we've received documents uh, regarding uh, Gulen. Uh, we're continuing to look at those documents. Uh, we've said also repeatedly that this is not going to be an overnight process uh, that needs to be studied. Uh, needs All the evidence needs to be looked at uh, before we can make a decision, uh, and we continue to process. So you, you, are, you are still not certain that these documents constitute a formal uh, extradition re request by, by the by the Turkish authorities? Uh, I think I'll just say that we continue to look at what we've received from uh, Turkish authorities and uh, study them and uh, analyze them, uh, and we'll make a decision uh, when we make a decision. I don't mean to be – I'm not trying to be trite or anything. I'm just trying to uh, convey that uh, this has been an exceptional uh, case in that we usually don't even get into this level of detail when talking about ex extradition requests. Um, but we have uh, acknowledged, at least, uh, that uh, because the Turks have been very public as well, uh, but we've also acknowledged that we have this treaty with them, that we're going to look at this, that we're going to work it through the system. But I think we owe it to the integrity uh, of this process uh, not to get into too many details and not call play-by-play -play, uh, on how we're feeling today about uh, where this stands. I think we need to be very deliberate, and we are being very deliberate about analyzing the materials that we've had. So I don't want to say, yes, this is a formal extradition request regarding this or that event or this or that concern uh, by the Turkish government. I just want to say we've received um, several batches of materials from the uh, Turkish authorities, and we're analyzing them. But, Mark, uh, the Kerry had a discussion of these uh yeah. A call with his Turkish counterpart today. That's right. Do you have a readout on what? Just that they did talk about, uh, uh, well, they talked about the breadth of uh, bilateral and regional issues. Uh, obviously, talked a lot about Syria and counter ISIL efforts, uh, but they did raise this uh, extradition matter. And who was the call from and to whom? That's a good question. Let me see if this. I want to say it was. Uh, no, you know what? Let me let me make sure. I, I think it was Chavez Soldo reaching out to uh, Secretary Kerry, but let me just double check that. At this point, you still haven't seen the minimum of evidence against Gulen, given that you haven't even arrested him to start the judicial, the extradition process. Well, right. I mean, we haven't made a decision. I mean, it wouldn't even be well, a minimal a minimum of evidence. I mean, we wouldn't. Uh, my understanding is that we wouldn't uh, take any action, legal action, against an individual until we. You don't stop a guy from determined. leaving the country while you're weighing there are his mechanisms extradition. In place to do that. Usually, a, if a guy's accused there, of masterminding there, a terrorist attack, you confine are, him before you decide on whether you're going to. You don't let him go free. I do understand you? what you're asking, but that, that that was not the question that I heard. And again, uh, talk to somebody over at the Department of Justice. But there are mechanisms in place uh, via short of an extradition that you can. Uh, stop someone or allow, not allow them to uh, Has his to passport place. been revoked or no, his, I, I or his freedom of travel been restricted? I would not speak to that. You cannot uh, speak to So, so you're, you're saying it's possible that you have taken some restrictions on his movement that just, just haven't been gonna, publicized? I'm not going to speak to his status. I'm not going to speak to where we're at in this process, Brad. And one more in Turkey. Uh, there was a document that came out from the German Interior Ministry. I don't know if you saw it that described Turkey as the central platform for Islamist militant groups in the Middle East, including uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, and Islamist militant groups in Syria. Is that your view, that Turkey is now the big Islamist on the block? I'm sorry, uh, where is this report from? German Interior Ministry. I've not seen it, so I don't want to speak to it. Is it what is your feeling on uh, Turkey's support for Islamist militantism? Um, look, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, Turkey has suffered, uh, frankly, uh, uh, from uh, uh, terrorism, uh, ISIL-related terrorism, but also PKK-related terrorism, uh, and has been victimized by uh, these terrorists. Uh, so I think that it is uh, – uh, and it is a, an important member of the coalition to defeat uh, Daesh uh, in Syria. Uh, and uh, beyond that, it is also acknowledged uh, that it has uh, uh, 
a problem with um, foreign fighters transiting or using its territory. And that's something that we've tried to focus on, frankly, uh, in trying to uh, uh, stop the flow of these foreign fighters into Syria and out of Syria, back into Western Europe and back into other parts of Europe. These continue to be challenges uh, that we're working to address with Turkey. Uh, our opinion, though, is that Turkey is a uh, an important democratic ally and NATO member. So you don't see it as a terror supporter or terror enabler, just as a terror victim? No. Uh, look, I mean, it, it is dealing, it is at a crossroads of uh, many of these different uh, um, groups and uh, um, ideologies, uh, and uh, it is, I think, uh, working hard to uh, confront these challenges and provide for the security of its people. Azerbaijan. Let's do Azerbaijan. I'll get to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Azerbaijan opposition figure Jafarli has been detained following his criticism of changes to the Constitution. Uh, what is the uh, position? of the State Department on his arrest, as well as these proposed changes to the Constitution. Um, so with regard to the arrest of, I think on August 12th, of uh, Azerbaijani opposition uh, uh, executives, uh, frankly, the Republican Alternative Movement Executive Secretary, uh, uh, his name is uh, Natik, as you noted, uh, Jafarli. Uh, we're very troubled by uh, his arrest. Uh, we're also troubled by reports that uh, of additional arrests of activists. Uh, we would urge strongly the Azerbaijani government uh, to release these and other activists who have been incarcerated in connection with exercising their fundamental freedoms. Uh, and uh, we call on them to respect the uh, fundamental freedoms of its citizens and to allow an open and public dialogue about the direction of their country, particularly in the run-up uh, to the planned September 26th 26, uh, constitutional amendment referendum. And so we would also urge the government to submit the constitutional amendments for a joint Venice Commission and ODIR opinion as well. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, your turn. Go ahead. Good question. South Asia. Okay. Thank you, sir. Starting with India, um, Mark, uh, U.S. is the most favored nation for visitations and investment in the U.S. for thousands of Indians. And now this, uh, at least uh, one Shah Rukh Khan keeps com coming to the U.S. and complaining against the U.S. This was the third time for him last week when he was held for four hours at the L.A. International Airport. Uh, he said because his name is Khan, Shah Rukh Khan. He said he is the superstar and billionaire, maybe Indian, Indian rupees. Um, last time he was held at the JFK for two hours and then Liberty International Airport in New York also for two hours. But few words which he tweeted, uh, I mean he tweeted, I cannot even uh, uh, say in public meeting here. But uh, Madam Nisa Desai she tweeted in one line, she said that, so, a casual sorry, even U.S. diplomats sometimes are pulled over and screened for extra screening. So what I'm asking you is, in India he made a big uh, thing about this and the Indian media is saying that U.S. apologized to Shah Rukh Khan. Is this casual sorry? Is apology or any comments? Uh, because he said, "Why I am always can, pulled by the can, can I, U.S. Uh, airports?" You know what, Goyal? Can I just look into it? I, I'm sorry. I, I just am not aware of the. the I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, glib. I'm just. I'm not aware of the what happened. I, I need to get all the facts of his uh, uh, of this case, and uh, I'll get back to you with an answer. And second, just a uh, um, quick question about India and uh, Pakistan. Okay. Both countries just celebrated Independence Day, yep. and uh, now Pakistan has invited again India for talks, conflict talks, and all that. But what Indian officials in Delhi are saying that after uh, supporting terrorism against India and also 
uh, Home Minister Mr. Rajnath was in Pakistan for the SARC meeting, which was a failure for him, or his visit was failure. And uh, Shushma Savaraj, the Foreign Minister of India, said that uh, we already said many times that unless until Pakistan stops terrorism against India, there is no way and use of talking. So, uh, so you have any comments about this? So I just, my only comment is that, and I've said this before, is that, you know, we would encourage uh, greater dialogue and counterterrorism cooperation between both Pakistan and India. Uh, we've said that many times. It's for the good of both countries. It's for the good of the region. Frankly, it's for the benefit of the United States. Um, you know, it's important that uh, Pakistan do the utmost to prevent uh, terrorists uh, from carrying out acts of terror, not just in Pakistan, but elsewhere in the region. Uh, so it's important that uh, there's greater collaboration, greater dialogue, and we would encourage any effort in that regard. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Yep. Please do. Yeah. Uh, Good to see her. Washington Post reported that um, President Obama is considering new nuclear weapons policy, which uh, includes the one that the U.S. will never use a nuclear um, weapon. For, uh, U.S. will never use the no first use, and then no first use, right? the report also said the Japanese Prime Minister uh, uh, expressed a concern to U.S. officials um, because Japan is, uh, Japan is worried about the threat from North Korea, but um, do you have any comment on that possible new... Well, I think theory? we share Japan's concern about the threat uh, of North Korea's actions. Um, look, you know, the President in his uh, landmark 2009 speech in Prague uh, talked about a way forward, uh, a path, if you will, that would uh, to a world without nuclear weapons. And, you know, in the past years, uh, this administration has achieved progress on a number of fronts in that regard, reducing our own deployed stockpiles and launchers uh, through the New START, uh, but also diminishing the role of nuclear weapons in our security strategy and securing the Iran deal. Uh, which will help, uh, we believe, stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, we are always looking for additional ways to achieve progress uh, towards the President's goal uh, while maintaining, and this is important, a credible deterrent uh, for the United States, our allies, and our partners. Uh, so, you know, we've said uh, we'll continue to review our planned modernization programs. We're going to continue to assess whether there are additional steps uh, that we can take to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our security strategy and pursue ways to strengthen the global non-proliferation regi regime further. Um, but as I said, we're always going to maintain a credible deterrent uh, for our friends and our allies. Follow up on that, have there been concerns expressed diplomatically by Japan and South Korea about this proposal that the President is supposed to make before the UN General Assembly next month? Uh, you know, I'm not aware. That's an honest answer. <laughs> I had two questions. The first one was on Gitmo. I was wondering if you can guarantee the American people that the 15 detainees released this week won't go right back out into the battlefield to fight against and target Americans, and if not, why continue to release them? Well, uh, good question. Um, I think that uh, uh, we've talked about this before, but um, what's important is that any time so as we uh, scale down uh, uh, Gitmo and hopefully one day uh, uh, close it all together, uh, the detainees have been vetted uh, through what is a very rigorous process. Um, and I can assure you that it's a very rigorous process. Uh, looked at all of the, uh, you know, uh, whether they would return to the battlefield. Uh, recidivist, uh, recidivism, I guess, is, is the terminology used. Um, is it 100 percent foolproof? Have there been no cases or zero cases of this happening? Well, no. Uh, there have been cases of it, but very few. Um, you know, I don't know the percentage in front of me, but it's, uh, it's incredibly small. Uh, by and large, uh, these detainees uh, that have been uh, sent to uh, various countries and governments who have accepted them have worked very hard to maintain uh, surveillance of these individuals, to keep track of them, keep an eye on them, if you will, uh, to ensure that they no longer pose a security threat to anyone, not just the American people, but to anyone. Um, that is something 
that we take uh, very seriously. Uh, these governments who take these uh, detainees on uh, and find them homes and resettle them also take it very seriously because it's on their home soil that these people are living. Uh, you know, that's, I think, step one in any kind of uh, plan to close Gitmo, where you relocate the detainees. I think security, safety of innocent civilians is uh, foremost. And I have another question on yeah, a sure. topic. Uh, we understand there was a discussion at the State Oh, yeah, sure. About Gitmo. So what is, uh, how many cases were former Gitmo uh, detainees were actually caught in attacking or planning attacks on the United States? Do you have any record of that? How many? How many incidents? You said that uh, there were some incidents. But you don't. Yeah, I don't. Anymore. There's, you know what, um, and I, I'm not trying to, but we can get you this. But the Department of Defense also puts out uh, recidivist rates. Uh, again, they're, they're relatively small. Yeah, it's a difficult word to put. Recidivism, <laughs> recidivism uh, rate. You know, in compared, let's say, to American prisoners and American prisons. I mean, how does it compare? I don't. In my understanding, it's a lot less. I don't, but that, that doesn't sound uh, uh, um, unrealistic to me. Please. Thank you. So we understand there was a discussion here at the State Department about the feasibility of then Secretary Clinton using a wireless earpiece or Bluetooth earpiece. This was roughly the same time period as lengthy discussions about BlackBerry use. So was there an informal discussion or a formal request within Secretary Clinton's proposed use of a wireless earpiece or Bluetooth? Um, hold on a second. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I think we just got this request uh, or this question in uh, uh, an hour or so ago. Um, we're looking at it. Uh, we don't have an answer for you yet. Uh, we'll get back to you when we know more about uh, whether and ind indeed uh, Secretary Clinton asked for or requested to use um, a Bluetooth or wireless earpiece within what I think you're talking about was within the seventh floor. And then um, what's the mahogany row, so called mahogany okay. row? Is there a State Department policy on Bluetooth devices from your security professionals or anything that way then? Well, again, we're looking into what the state of policy is. I mean, in general, uh, you know, any kind of Bluetooth, uh, you know, it's a security assessment, uh, whether any kind of device, whether uh, whether it's a phone or, as I said, a Bluetooth earpiece uh, might be used uh, uh, as a way to gain access to information or uh, listen in on conversations. Uh, but I don't have a clear uh, definitive policy for you. We'll get that for you. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Please. The, the Washington Post oh. has a big Sorry. story that you have doubtless seen that lays a lot of responsibility on the White House for the messy situation in Iraq today. That after 2012, when the U.S. troops withdrew, it pressed for extensive cutbacks <laughs> in State Department programs slated for Iraq. Over objections of both the military and the State Department with negative consequences. Do you concur in that assessment? And if not, why not? I'm aware of the article. I mean, look, um, it's a very lengthy piece uh, and uh, lengthy analysis. Um, I guess in answer to your question, I would say that, you know, I can acknowledge that our security relationship uh, is fundamentally different than it was uh, than the one we had with Iraq uh, prior to 2011. We all know that. Um, you know, the majority of programs that were run by the Department of Defense uh, weren't impacted as much by budget cuts as they were by uh, the fundamental change in our security cooperation uh, with Iraq, as well as the departure of uh, thousands of Department of Defense personnel. Um, and I think that they can probably speak in greater detail to those uh, programs or the effect or ramifications of those programs being closed or shut down or scaled back. Um, and it also should be noted that the government of Iraq uh, also had a say in all of these decisions. Uh, they are a sovereign country, as I mentioned previously. Uh, so there were Department of State programs, uh, for instance, uh, that they were not in favor of supporting at that point in time or at that time. Um, I also think with regard to our general uh, focus or how we're targeting or going about uh, pursuing uh, a strategy to root out <coughs> terrorist networks in Iraq, we're doing it in a different way. And we've talked a lot about that. 
I mean, how we're going after ISIL and Daesh in Iraq right now is that we are working through the government of Iraq uh, to build up the capabilities of Iraq's forces to destroy, dismantle uh, ISIL, to rebuild these communities, and to provide for the security of the Iraqi people going forward. That's a hard thing to do, harder than just putting a lot of U.S. troops on the ground in some ways and going after ISIL and Daesh, but it's an important thing to do because ultimately this is about, uh, you know, enabling uh, Iraq to provide for its own security. Uh, and we've seen on the battlefield uh, Iraq's forces, security forces, have shown that they have the ability, and we've seen it with Kurdish forces as well, the ability to defeat, go after, defeat ISIL, to remove them, and then in places where we've seen uh, uh, them rebuild communities that have been devastated by ISIL. As I said, this is a long-term strategy, but it's one we have to do in conjunction with uh, the Iraqi government, and we have to succeed at if we want Iraq to be able to, frankly, stand on its own two feet going forward. Please. Um, back to the emails. Sure. Um, just a couple of, of clarification points. So can you, are you able to say the number of emails that the FBI will be turning over to Congress as part of um, Turning over to Congress. Um, I don't think I do have that. I, I apologize. Um, sorry for the awkward pause as I look through this. Dramatic pause. Dramatic pause. <laughs> Thank you. I don't. We'll try to see if we can get you a firm number on that. Um, so it would not be the entirety of the thousands of Clinton emails that. Well, no. Um, and again, my understanding is that these are not just Clinton emails. These are emails from other individuals and sources um, that haven't been out there uh, yet. So it's not just. These are not unseen Clinton emails. These are uh, from different sources, different individuals. I, I don't know how to put it. And going back to the Judicial Watch, uh, sure. earlier in August, you had released a statement saying that these documents would be made public as part of your legal obligation. So as far as the Clinton emails that were originally procured by the FBI that were then handed over to the State Department, so will those still be made public? I'm sorry. So just to clarify, you're talking about, right, the thousands of e documents that the FBI provided. Um, we, we have agreed to produce to Judicial Watch any emails um, uh, sent in her official capacity. Um, we are still trying to uh, come up with uh, a decision on how we'll or whether we'll release them publicly as we did with the 55,000. So, so, I, so it is now a question as to whether they, it would be up to Judicial Watch as to whether or not they were to become public. Um, Yes. Uh, well, no. I mean, not, uh, look, I mean, we're still assessing, I guess is how I'd put it at this point. We have voluntarily agreed to produce to Judicial Watch these emails, and we've uh, made that in a court, fi court filing that last Friday. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in answer to Brad's question, which is, are we going to put them up on state's FOIA website like we did with the previous 55,000? We're still trying to assess how, we're, how or if we're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. on, on yesterday there was the, the, the question was asked on the bombardment of the, the hospital operated by bo uh, doctors yeah, without course, borders yeah. and, and the school. I wonder if you have received any word from the Saudis that they have begun conducting an investigation of where the situation is. Well, um, certainly, and I think we spoke to this yesterday, uh, we strongly urge all sides to end these kinds of offensive military actions uh, in Yemen. Uh, we express our condolences to the victims, uh, families of yesterday's uh, horrible uh, attacks, uh, or airstrikes, rather. Um, it goes without saying that civilians are the most vulnerable victims of any conflict, and we're always concerned by civilian casualties, and especially in this case, uh, in this conflict. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, we have obviously expressed our concerns to uh, the Saudi-led coalition. We've urged them, as I said, to cease all military action. Uh, uh, 
the only solution to Yemen's challenges, as we have said many times, is through peaceful dialogue. So we reiterate our calls for the Saudi-led coalition to take all feasible measures to protect, protect civilians while also ensuring accountability and in avoiding uh, future civilian harm. Um, uh, as I, I don't think there's an update on yesterday's uh, statement that we said that uh, the Saudi-led coalition has announced it will conduct an investigation. Uh, I would just add that we would urge them to do it very quickly and to release their findings publicly. Thanks, guys. Thanks, oh. oh, one more on yeah. One more. Sorry. Do you have any response to a bipartisan group of senators who have expressed their concerns about the um, the continual sale of arms to Saudi Arabia, Arabia, given these civilian casualties? I mean, I'll you know, any uh, look. I mean, I haven't seen the letter, so I, I, I'm hesitant to respond to it, except to say that you know, any defense or security products that we give to or sell to uh, Saudis, as with any country. Are, uh, are under the end use protocols uh, that always uh, look at ha and monitor and usage of them. And defensive weapons to Saudi Arabia is that, I mean, fighter jets are def purely defensive. Uh, Sorry, missile. security materials. Apologies. Right. Did you get any update from the UN on South Sudan? Uh, no, I don't believe so, T. Jenner. Let me just look very quickly. Sorry, guys. I'm not trying to. Um, I think we're pretty much where we were yesterday. Okay. Um, but let me just very quickly look here. I mean, we, what I, all I can say is that we've uh, raised uh, this incident and our concerns uh, with uh, senior officials in the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the Secretary General's staff, and we're going to continue to seek clarification on the UN's response uh, to the incident on July 11th. Uh, we'll continue to pressure the UN to improve security for all unmissed personnel as well as NGO workers and civilians. Thanks, guys. Yeah.